In America today, for every $100 of white family wealth, black families only have about $5.04. In fact, the percentage of the total wealth owned by black Americans hasn't really grown appreciably since the Civil War. This level of inequality isn't about failing to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's a direct result of centuries of racist banking policies and practices that systematically kept black Americans from prospering. After emancipation, President Lincoln approved reparations to help former slaves transition from being treated as property to owning property. Each family was supposed to receive 40 acres and a mule. But after Lincoln's assassination, that order was reversed by President Andrew Johnson. What the free slaves did get was a bank, the Freedmen's Savings Bank. Over the next decade, former slaves deposited their hard-earned wages, more than $75 million, into this bank. But it turned out to be a one-way relationship. The bank's white management refused to give any loans to its black clients. Instead, they lost nearly half the money on bad investments before the bank closed in 1874. The federal government failed to hold anyone accountable for this loss. Soon after that, Jim Crow laws were enacted across the South, and owning land became even less attainable for black Americans. In the 1930s, President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal helped create a new middle class, but it also further cemented the racial wealth gap. With the help of the federal infrastructure, tens of thousands of banks and credit unions were created at this time to issue mortgages that, in effect, all went to white families. During this time, neighborhoods were explicitly zoned to reinforce segregation, and those in black neighborhoods were denied mortgages. These policies essentially helped create two separate credit markets, one of the affluent white suburbs and the other of the black ghettos. This is law professor Mirsa Baradaran. She wrote about this history in her book, The Color of Money. The segregation of our um, banks and our neighborhoods and our mortgage credit, it was a partnership of banks, homeowners who didn't want to live in black areas. Uh, it was realtors who wouldn't sell to blacks. It was the market deciding that a white neighborhood was worth more than a black neighborhood. It was the regulators not stepping in. It was the legislature not stepping in. You know, it's not just the Klan that did this. You know, it was a whole American society. Civil rights leaders recognized the fundamental economic injustice and proposed bold solutions, including integration, reparations, and land grants. But once again, at this fork in the road of American history, the nation took the wrong path. Instead of going forward with any of these radical solutions, President Nixon proposed black capitalism, a series of policies that encouraged black entrepreneurship and asked corporations to voluntarily support black-owned banks. This policy paid lip service to closing the racial wealth gap but in reality did nothing to fix the underlying problem. Variations of the toothless black capitalism policy have been carried on by every administration since Nixon. That we never fixed our legacy of Jim Crow, white supremacy, credit discrimination, all of these systemic problems, and to put a little band-aid on it and say, okay, well, we'll celebrate entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs, that's not the answer. While U.S. law banned explicit racial discriminatory banking in the late 1960s, racism in the industry is still alive and well. In the early 2000s, federally regulated banks and other financial institutions profited from selling many subprime loans which charged higher interest to compensate for higher risk of default. Many were designed to make repayments difficult or impossible. These toxic loans were purposely peddled to black neighborhoods. In one lawsuit filed by the city of Memphis, Wells Fargo bank officials testified that employees referred to minority customers as mud people and subprime loans as ghetto loans. And data shows discrimination in lending was based on race, not economic status. By 2006, Higher income black Americans, including many who could qualify for regular loans, were four times as likely to have subprime loans as higher income white Americans. The Federal Reserve's own survey at the time revealed as much, but they didn't act to stop the bank's predatory lending practices. By 2008, the housing bubble burst, and no community felt the consequences more than black Americans. From Jamaica, Queens in New York City to Oakland, California, strong middle-class African-American neighborhoods that saw nearly two decades of gains, watched them reversed in a matter not of years, but of months. Any way you look at it, that's an absolute tragedy. So surely we've learned our lesson from this tragedy. Apparently not. 
The Trump administration is rolling back regulations put on the big banks after the 2008 financial crisis. And the subprime loans are being sold under the name of non-prime loans in many communities of color. The racial wealth gap has not closed in 200 years, and it won't close in the next 200, unless the government acknowledges its role in creating and perpetuating economic inequalities. It's up to the government to fix the problem it started.